Hello everyone and welcome to today's Australian Airports Association webinar. Today's topic is Managing Aeronautical Data and Information for Aerodrome Users Operators. We are pleased to welcome our presenter for today, David Foster. This webinar is live and interactive. You are encouraged to participate by posting questions to the presenter which can be typed into the chat box at the bottom left corner of your screen. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If you're experiencing audio difficulty during the webinar, please dial the 1-800 support number listed in the chat box. I'll now hand you over to David to begin. Thank you, Renan, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be able to present this webinar today and thank the Australian Airports Association for the opportunity to share this important information with uh, AAA members. Okay, so uh, David Foster is my name, as you saw. Uh, in today's webinar, I'd like to share with you some background information on how aeronautical data and information is managed, and then we'll focus on more specific topics relevant for aerodrome owners and operators. So let's quickly have a look at uh, what I'll be discussing today. Uh, first off, I'd like to provide you with a brief overview of the AIS service we provide and a quick insight into the way we do the things we do. And then highlight what is AIM and how has it changed the way we need to manage aeronautical data. Then I'll touch on the regulation and highlight some of the specific aspects that are relevant for today's topics. Here we'll start getting into the details of what is required by aerodrome owners and operators as data originators. Then we'll look at the data product specification and explain what they are and what is their purpose. Following this, I'll outline the next steps Air Services plans to undertake and time permitting address some of the questions. So we'll kick off into the webinar now. Every country around the world provides an aeronautical information service in one form or another. And like most things in this industry, there is the official document that outlines what is the service and how it is delivered. That document is ICAO Annex 15. So this is a small extract from the Annex, but I'll break it down to an even in more informal summary. Air services get given data, we check it for gross errors, completeness, accuracy, format, then we store it, pretty it up, and package it and then push it out as products at regular intervals for industry to use in any number of aviation related activities. And just as a side note, an example of the gross error checks the teams look at when the data is received, one would be TORA and STODA data. The team checked that the ASDA and the TOTA values are higher than the TORA value if a stop weight and a clear weight are present. As I mentioned, we only do gross error checks we do not do detailed technical ver verification that the values are correct. So who in our services provides the AIS service? The ATM data service team do this, and we're a relatively small group of dedicated people who process massive amounts of aeronautical information and data every year. For example, since the 1st of January 2018 to today, the team have received and responded to more than 1,300 data-related emails, resulting in over 42,000 database changes, issued over 53,000 NOTAMs, and created and published 77 aeronautical charts, an URSA, a DAP, an AIP, and a DAH twice per year. While many of you are familiar with the 28-day ARAC cycle for changing aer aeronautical data, Another important point I'd like to highlight today to you is our data cutoff dates. To allow us to manage the large amount of data that we publish in our products, we create and publish a document amendment calendar, which is available on the Air Services website. The design of our aeronautical database production systems are all based on a regulated, regu regulated requirements and processes. And as such, we need to establish cutoff dates for the data so that we can maintain that data quality and meet our product publication and distribution dates. It's important to note if we receive a data change request after these public cutoff dates, we cannot accept that change for the next update of that product. It will be entered in the following subsequent update. 
next slide uh, depicts the flow of data through our data processing chain. So right at the start, we have the originators or owners of the data. On receipt of the request, it's initially triaged by the team to verify it has come from the authorised person in the first instance. Its priority relative to the effective error dates and the data cutoff dates and its completeness. If there are any issues discovered during this triage stage, the data change request is sent back to the originator to correct it or clarify the details. Once through this first gate, the team create a work package, which becomes the source or evidence, if you like, of so that we have traceability of what is being changed, when it is effective, who requested it, and what product it affects. The data is then entered in the database by one operator and is verified as having been entered correctly by another operator. Once we reach the respective cutoff dates mentioned on the previous slide, we run a process called promoting the data, which in effect collates all the data, including the changes made up to that point, and delivers it to our product production systems. The service delivery team and charting teams then start a second round of checks before the products are produced, compiled and generated. And at the end, one final quality check is completed and the products are distributed. Sounds simple, right? And we do have a lot of sound processes and procedures and the teams deliver the AI service the best of their ability. However, we do face a number of challenges including legacy data quality, manual processing of some data elements, and data originator knowledge of aeronautical data quality requirements, which I hope this webinar will provide for AAA members. This last point is very important as air services and data originators need to work in partnership to ensure aeronautical data is published in accordance with regulatory and aeronautical data quality requirements for the safety of all users of our data. So at ATM Data Services, we utilise a number of email addresses to assist us channel inbound information to the right areas in the first instances. This is a list of those email accounts and the relevant uh, topics that uh, emails should be sent to. You can refer to this and it's also available on the Air Services website. AIS to AIM. Same thing, right? Sort of? Uh, not really. If you think of AIS as the old way of managing aeronautical data and information, very paper-based, information stored within the products, and some form of traceability. The key difference with AIM is that it's all about a transition to data-driven products, system-wide information management and system data sharing. So um, this global ICAO-led activity across the entire industry supports these types of data management and data sharing principles, which are all in place to achieve our aeronautical, to ensure our aeronautical data meet the quality requirements for accuracy, resolution, integrity, and traceability. Within Australia, CASA have introduced CASR 175 to provide a regulatory framework to assist Australia transition to the AIM goal. What is part 175 about? As I mentioned before, it's a framework that puts standards and requirements in place for aeronautical data to ensure safe air navigation. The regulation, like all regulations, have subparts for this and that, paragraphs and subparagraphs, etc. But today, we're just going to look at two subparts. Subpart B basically is for air services or AIS providers. So it established the standards and requirements around what air services needs to do as an AIS provider in managing aeronautical data. Subpart D sets out the requirements for data originators. This includes aerodrome owners and operators. If you want to have more detailed information on the regulation, you can download it from the CASA website. So what is an aeronautical data originator? So this is the definition out of the reg. A data originator or an individual responsible for providing aeronautical data to the AS provider. 
Just a note for everyone, the integrated AIP mentioned in that definition includes not just the AIP, AIP book, it's the URSA, the DRH, DAP, AIP charts and also electronic data sets. So who can be an aeronautical data originator? A lot of people in the industry think Air Services is the data originator for all the information that is published. This is not correct under 175, or was it prior to 175? Yes, Air Services and specific sections within the organisation are deemed data originators for specific data or information, such as ATC units, etc. But there are many other organisations and individuals that are aeronautical data originators. We have many of the government agencies that have specific data ownership and responsibilities. Defence, obviously. The various aerodrome owners and operators, from the majors through the regionals, and even down to hospitals where helicopter landing sites are located. Data originators are also infrastructure owners, or power companies, and wind farm operators. Also, Part 173 flight procedure design companies that design the IFR approaches at your aerodromes, they are data originators. Or even it can be an individual who has a little airstrip on his property that is used by the local flying club for flying events. As you can see, we obviously collect data from a large cross-section of players in the industry. As you can imagine, ensuring we get data from the correct person or organisation is challenging. So now I would like to introduce you to the AIP responsible person. Yes, it's a single person, and no, it's not scary to be one. Here's an extract from part 175 that describes an AIP responsible person. If you recall one of the aeronautical data quality requirements I mentioned earlier, it's traceability of data and the changes to that data. Having a registered AIP responsible person does this. It allows traceability of the ownership of aeronautical data and authority to request changes to that data. Once received, we then publish it on your behalf in the integrated AIP products. And as mentioned before, that's a number of products. So one of the requirements of 175 is to have aeronautical data originators registered with Air Services. Now we have two registration processes for uh, aerodrome owners and operators. This particular one is related to certified registered or unregistered aerodromes with a fact page. As many of you know, Part 175 came into effect in 2015, and Air Services had an ADA registration form in place since then and was available on the Air Services website. For most, for most certified registered and unregistered aerodromes with fact pages, we do have names and contact details. However, following the review of this information, we have not clearly identified a number of ARP responsible people in many cases, and a large number of the email details we have, once checked, bounce back to us. So we've introduced a new form for registration and it will be available on the website from Monday the 25th of February. As we just saw, each data originator requires an AIP responsible person registered. This person's details are entered at the top of this new form. But a good thing for the person who's the AIP responsible person they can nominate other ADOs to act on their behalf. If you are the AIP responsible person and elect to do this, we require you to establish a group email so that you can send data change requests to us from one email account. The form will also ask you if you're the NIS NOTAM group manager. And at this point, I'd like to make an uh, important delineation between the AIP responsible person and ADOs registered with that form, and also a NOTAM originator registered person. So as a registered AIP responsible person and any nominated AADO acting on their behalf, that is also registered in NAPES as a NOTAM originator, you can make permanent changes to the data published in the integrated AIP, and generally in your case as an aerodrome operator, would be the ESA fact page. And you can also issue temporary NOTAMs affecting operations at your airport. When the request for permanent changes become effective before the next update of the URSA, 
Perm no TAM is issued, advising industry of the changes to the URSA. Once the changes are incorporated into the URSA, the perm no TAM is cancelled. However, you can have the situation where a person at your aerodrome in the operations section or acting on your behalf is only registered as a no TAM originator in NAPES and is not registered as an ADO under the AIP responsible person. This person can only issue temporary no TAMs. They cannot request changes to the data published in the URSA. Please note any requests received from individuals registered only as NAPES no TAM originators will be returned to that no TAM originator. It's also important to note that the only person that can advise their services of any changes to the registered ADOs is the AIP responsible person listed at the top of the form. For uncertified aerodromes, ALAs and helicopter landing sites that do not have fact pages, we've simplified the process and collect all the information, contact details on one form. We have still have a significant number of ALAs and helicopter landing sites that we have not been advised of a responsible person for that location. To identify these locations, we've introduced a verified and unverified classification. Effective May 2019, these will be depicted on the charts as such, uh, with different symbologies reflecting the verified and unverified aerodromes. A point to note, owners and operators of these aerodromes are not issued with the formal DPS. So what is a DPS? Put it simply, it's a document that describes who the parties are, what the details of the agreement and what data you own, when you'll give it to us, how you'll give it to us, and how we're going to process the data. Uh, in simple language, that's what a DPS is. Now here's the official version extract from CASA Part 175. Stipulates that we have to give a written data product specification and then it goes into the details of what must be included in a DPS. I'll quickly put these up on the screen. I won't go through those. You can review those at a later date. As you can see, quite comprehensive and partly the reason why we've had to create the new DPS uh, to make sure that all that information was included in it. Moving on to our new data product specifications. As mentioned before, the requirements of CASA 165 correction CSR 175 and the requirements to have a DPS came into effect in 2015. Air Services did create a DPS at the time and placed it on the website for aerodrome operators to refer to. However, following a number of reviews of the content of the generic DPS, and clarification of the regulation in respect of DPS content and individual ADO data responsibilities, Air Services is required to issue a new DPS to every individual data originator. This includes all 380 odd certified registered aerodromes and any other aerodrome listed in the URSA with a fact page. A significant change to having a generic DPS posted on the web page for aerodrome operators to refer. A new DPS has three sections. The first section, if you like, is the terms and conditions and the type or irrelevant to the information. The second section is tailored to each individual data originator. So it will list the specific data responsibilities and any special conditions attached to that. Section three outlines the data quality requirements for the accuracy and resolution. It stipulates uh, for each data element uh, how it is to be provided, whether it's numerical, to what decimal point it is, uh, lat longs, whether it's degrees, minutes, seconds, or tens of seconds, etc. Uh, so it's quite detailed. We'll now look at each individual section quickly. Section one, as I said, 
consider it as a terms and conditions of how you provide the data, etc. Section two, this is a small sample of an aerodrome operator's CPS section two, where it outlines the details of the fact page. There are additional information in section two regarding such things as the provision of type A and B aerodrome charts if applicable, and various other information. Let's quickly have a look at some of the specific points to note for aerodrome operator ADOs. Responsibility for the majority of your data is in the URSA fact page and RDS sections. Generally, aerodrome ADOs will mainly be ensuring that the information in the URSA is up to date. However, it's very important to understand who owns what sections of the fact page, as quite often there are joint ownership sections, and there's also some sections that aerodrome operators cannot change. We do publish data that you provide us in other products, such as the runway threshold coordinates in the DAH. So we do uh, flow through that data you provide into other products. The ERSA intro section provides information on the fact page layout and examples, so I encourage you to refer to those to get more details on the ERSA fact page formats. CPS section three, this last section outlines the data quality requirements for data elements and information we collect and publish. As you can see from this list, there are a number of regulatory requirements and international standards that we must follow in relation to managing aeronautical data. While it may appear a bit over the top, quality aeronautical data is now so critical to ensure that the many systems across the aviation industry function correctly and talk to each other seamlessly without manual intervention. Data quality requirements also make sure that data originators and the AIS provider are on the same page in regard to what data they own and how you're going to give it to us. Whether it be a geographical coordinate for a runway threshold or the code that you use for the pavement strength or even just to identify if the information is text. In short, data quality requirements help avoid confusion. Data change requests. Obviously keeping published aeronautical data up to date is very important, as you never know when someone will need to refer to it. While highly unlikely this crew would be checking the URSA, it's important to remember that the information that you provide us is used by other data providers who supply information to airline operators, which is loaded into aircraft flight management computers. You as an aerodrome data originator, can submit data change requests via email to DocAmends. This has always been the case, and we accept data change requests at any time. Just note the data cutoff comments made earlier. In introducing the new DPS, we're also looking at introducing some formatting changes to the way you submit the information using emails. And request that you use these when sending them through to us. For example, in the email subject line, request you use this following convention. DCR, data change request, the Y code of your aerodrome, and then a brief description of what the change is about. This is ended in the email subject line. Within the DPS section one, we've also provided additional guidance on how we would like you to format the content of the email so we can clearly understand what you are requesting to be changed. We hope this reduces the number of email exchanges between the ATM data services team and data originators seeking clarification of what is being requested. When you're looking at submitting a change, I encourage you to check section three of your DPS to ensure that the data 
and the information you're providing is being given in the correct resolution and to the correct accuracy levels. Note, we will reject any change requests if it's received in the wrong format and resolution. This is all part of the data quality requirements and the framework part 175 screens to managing aeronautical information. And don't forget, in addition to the ARAC dates, those publication cutoff dates. Some AAA members may have heard we were looking at using smart PDF data collection forms. We are no longer going down that path and have transferred our effort to exploring technological solutions to provide data originators with a portal that they can log into and view their data and submit changes online. ASA will keep industry informed as that journey unfolds. So just a heads up on the next step uh, that we would like to ask aerodrome owners and operators to consider is to review and identify your AFP responsible person and other nominated ADOs. From Monday, the form will be available on the website. If you can complete the new registration form and send it through to us at adoairservicesaustralia.com. On receipt of that notification, Air Services will issue you a new DPS. Once you receive that DPS, if you can just confirm the data ownership and make sure you understand the requirements of the DPS. If you can also review your internal processes and procedures to ensure that they are up to date and in line with the requirements of the DPS in regard to updating aeronautical data and reviewing it. One important thing to note is that 175 also requires data originators to conduct a yearly review of the data that's published on their behalf. The yearly review will be conducted 12 months after the new DPS is issued. Once you've done the review, it's simply a, and there is no changes and all the data is correct, you can just simply email DocAmends with the subject line of the email, ADO yearly review, YABC, being the Y code of your aerodrome, all published data and information correct. If you do discover an error, error during the yearly review, simply adjust the email subject line to include dash DCR data change request and a brief description of the correction. Then in the main body of the email, describe the change required as per DPS section one. That pretty much include, uh, concludes the presentation part of the webinar today. Uh, if you require further information after the conclusion of the webinar, you can email ado at airservicesaustralia.com and we'll uh, respond to you there. Now I'll just have a look at some of the questions coming in. Okay, Adrian B just uh, wants to confirm uh, where we go to complete the new registration form. The form will be available on the Air Services website from next Monday. Uh, so you can obtain, download it from there and uh, complete it. Uh, we have been working with the CASA Aerodrome inspectors uh, on this topic of DPSs and Part 175. Uh, all the aerodrome inspectors have been briefed and um, they uh, have committed to assist um, the certified aerodromes uh, in uh, any issues with 175 and DPSs. Check some more questions. So there's a question here, are permanent no TAMs obsolete? Uh, no, uh, while ever we do not have um, a, uh, what shall we say, real-time publication of aeronautical data and where there's always a, a lag in the production, 
uh, perm no TAMs will still be required to advise the industry of changes to the publications. Once those changes have been updated in the publications, the perm no TAMs are cancelled. Now, there's further to that question. Okay, so temp um, no term authorised issuers, uh, if they're only registered as a no term authorised uh, person, they can only issue temporary no terms for the aerodrome, uh, such as cranes, uh, those sort of uh, tactical type. Uh, events that require a temporary NOTAM. However, if they're only registered as a NOTAM originator, they cannot submit a change for an entry in the URSA. Uh, that needs to come from either the AIP responsible person or an ADO that that AIP responsible person has nominated to act on their behalf. Uh, Nicole, uh, do we still need to send amendments for the URSA if we have a perm no TAM. Uh, generally, the process there, Nicole, if you uh, if you raise a perm no TAM, uh, that will come through to the ATM data services team, and uh, they will use that as uh, authority to do it. Um, however, the other other mechanism to put those changes into the ERSA is obviously to email, as we mentioned in the webinar there, uh, to DocAmends. Um, with raising a perm NOTAM by the NOTAM office, they will check uh, and ensure that the person requesting that NOTAM is registered as an ARP responsible person or an ADO. I hope that answers your question there, Nicole. Elma, are there data security requirements? Um, just might need to expand on that question for me, Elma. Uh, Julie, will the Word version still need to be? Uh, yes, so I believe it's part three of uh, your ops manual, Julie. Um, we have been, as I mentioned before, working with the CASA inspectors. Um, the way we envisage it, uh, we're hoping once we get this portal uh, working that um, Aerodrome operators will be able to use uh, that portal to one, notify CASA of changes to that information that's stored in section three of your ops manual that the uh, CASA auditors, uh, CASA inspectors uh, review and also advise air services at the same time. So we're looking for some synergies there in the future uh, to, to try and reduce that uh, multiple notification requirement. Okay, so, yeah, so just to clarify about the um, the perm no term thing, uh, obviously um, complex and lengthy changes uh, we prefer to receive via Doxamend, um, and uh, you know if the if the perm perm no term should only be if it's uh, needs to be advised immediately, uh, if it's something that's um, can wait until the next update. Um, yeah, we prefer to go through docs, docs amend. Um, Ashley, yes, the presentation remains on the AAA um, website uh, for viewing at a later date. Stephanie, I think that, uh, as I mentioned, this PowerPoint will be uh, available on the AAA uh, webinar uh, section. Uh, we've only, in regard to the portal, um, 
we're at very early stages at the moment. We're uh, reviewing um, what the requirements would be and what we'd have to have in place for that. Um, so it's very early stages in regard to having a portal. Um, but as I mentioned, we'll keep keep industry informed as we progress through that. And we will be seeking, um, obviously, some input from uh, aeronautical data originators to how uh, how we can work with them to make sure that portal is user friendly. Uh, Jared, yeah, as I mentioned there, that um, if if you can review your um, ARP responsible person and ADOs. Uh, and you wish to send us the form, we'll take that. But we do have a program in place where we're um, working through all our uh, aerodromes uh, that we have um, in the ERSA fact section. Uh, we're targeting the majors first, uh, first, and then we will work through um, all the aerodromes. But uh, more than happy to, for you to submit uh, an updated um, ARP responsible person form and that will be the trigger for us to um, to get you but if you if you if you're confident that your contact details for people that are sending in data change requests are correct uh, we will get to you eventually if you don't wish to do the form straight away And uh, Elmo, is it, um, yeah, Elmo, in terms of security and data exchange confidentiality agreements, um, I'll take that one on notice, uh, Elmo, and uh, come back to you with a response on that one, if that's okay. Did anyone, anybody want to go back to a specific uh, slide and uh, discuss anything? As mentioned previously, we've worked with the CASA inspectors. I've also working with uh, a couple of the major aerodromes uh, with the new DPSs just to uh, get their feedback and ensure that the information contained in it is uh, understandable and uh, user friendly. Um, so hopefully you'll find that once you get issued your DPS. No more questions. We might uh, conclude the webinar. And uh, as mentioned, please feel free to, if you require further information or think anything, uh, think of anything else. Uh, after we conclude here, you can e email ado at airservicesaustralia.com, and we'll uh, get back to you. Okay, if uh, let's go, okay, Renan, we might conclude the um, webinar. Thanks. Okay, thank you, David, for your presentation, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, please take a moment to complete the survey, which has appeared on your screen, and we thank you in advance for your feedback and wish you a pleasant afternoon.